For USCFootball.com, I'm Keely Orr here with Dan Weber for instant analysis of USC's Wednesday practice of Fresno State Week. Now, we're still in the same old media rules where we can only see the first 20 minutes of practice, come back for interviews, but we have been able to pick up on something so far this week, and it looks like we had heard that Andrew Voorhees, uh, the guard for USC, was limited in Saturday's scrimmage that USC held uh, the closed practice on Saturday, uh, and so we've kind of seen that so far from what we've been able to pick up. We will be able to ask Clay Helton about that tomorrow on Thursday when we get to talk to him again, but what we've seen so far is that first team offensive line lineup uh, is uh, Jalen McKenzie moved inside to right guard and then having Drew Richmond transfer on that right tackle side. And then in the second team, we didn't see Andrew Voorhees today when they do the little walkthrough. So that's a little development there. We're not exactly sure what's going on with Andrew Voorhees, but that is something that we were able to pick on so far, pick up on so far this week. I mean, he was out here. Uh, he had his helmet on, so yeah. he wasn't like you know one of the the rehab guys, and he was standing on the sideline. I, we're just not sure what 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 it means. Uh, but we know they were experimenting a little bit. I think would have been before any issues unless something came up 10 days ago because yeah. we knew that they were doing a little experimenting once I think Austin Jackson came back the way he did and they felt like oh he's really he's ready to go mm -hmm. uh, then they're thinking well now what about uh, Drew Richmond who'd been filling in at left tackle so so I, I, we're still not certain what we're seeing we know we're seeing uh, uh, a first offense or a second offense that, that, that do not have uh, Andrew Voice in there right now. Yeah. What do you? What does USC gain with that lineup having moving Jalen McKenzie inside and having Drew Richmond on right tackle? I know we weren't sure about where we would see them, but that seems like you get some some different things when you put uh, Jalen McKenzie inside. Well, he he, you know, as, as big as Andrew is at six six and three, you know, ten or fifteen, whatever. Jalen just seems like a wider body, and yeah. he just seems like maybe. Um, a wider wingspan or just maybe covers the uh, the wide splits a little bit differently um, might have a little bit uh, quicker burst out of his stance where you know you want to get that angle on if they're trying to take advantage of the wider splits you know you've got you've got to kind of you know take that angle and, and, and take it away from them so so I don't know if uh, you want to I mean I you look at Andrew maybe and he's done some um, good run blocking this year. So maybe there's a way of, uh, you know, that, that, that they alternate him. But, uh, but uh, Jalen might be a little bit more um, uh, kind of a pass block first guy. You know, again, you know, until we see him actually play play um, against other teams, I don't, th I don't think we know. But yeah. uh, I mean, it's good to have that kind of uh, ability to – to move things around. And I didn't think they had that really almost at all the last couple of years. Uh, whereas this year it looks like uh, they've got some ability to do that and, yeah. and they're not locked in. And we'll see you know, how it plays out. I, I don't know, you know, is Justin Dietrich at center and Liam Jimmins at guard, are they, you know, factors also that they were kind of mentioned in sort of a first eight with, uh, with Clay the last uh, you know, few days. So. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, Wednesday is a defensive day, which means we get to talk to defensive players and coaches. And, Dan, you got to talk to Christian Rector. And something we talked about on Tuesday's instant analysis is just how the players seem to think that this team is closer. There's a different chemistry this time around. And Christian Rector seemed to have that, that thought process as well, and it's helping him become a better leader in that sense. Well, he said it's easier to be a leader this year. He said last year it was hard to be a leader. He felt bad that he wasn't able to be a leader and speak up. And I said, well, it was hard for the leaders, wasn't it? And he said, yeah, it was just, it was just something that was different. He said, this team, there's a different feel about this team. And I don't think there's any of us that haven't noticed that. Uh, yeah. And we talked to Clancy. He said, uh, the thing they do better, if you look from this year to last year, is they play better as a unit. They're more, more unified, more able to do things together. Uh, and that was just something that last year, it just didn't happen for last year. And there was, you know, a way that that team just didn't bond. Um, it looked more like individuals than, than guys that played as a team. And this team really looks like they want to be a team and that they want to play together. And uh, Christian said um, he feels like he is a leader, but he said it's not that hard to be a leader on this team this year compared to last year. So and that's kind of a 
Uh, he's, he's an interesting kid to talk to because uh, he will tell you, I really feel bad that I didn't do it last year. I didn't get, I didn't get that done. And he said, I think uh, and with this team, uh, it's, it, they're having fun uh, playing the way they're playing. And they, um, again, talk to them about people want to know, what about Fresno? And this, what, you haven't seen the quarterback. He hasn't played very much. And he had a really inter interesting way of saying it. You know, somebody was saying, are you going to go back and look at his junior college stuff and all that? And he said, you know, we're not going to chase. We're not chasing ghosts. You know, we're just we're going to go out there. They got to play against us. They got to figure out a way to stop us. So we're not going to spend a lot of time uh, doing that kind of thing. And, and, you know, it echoes what Clancy said. That yeah. This is about them being them and playing their game and seeing, you know, it's, it's a different philosophy than last year. And it's, a, I think, a much more uh, correct way to go about it. Yeah, and another philosophy that we've heard about is just how the simpleness of the defense or or how it's pared down as far as the playbook goes. And I got to talk to Pal E.A. Nayotote today, and he talked about how just there's such a difference between his freshman year and his sophomore year because he was so overwhelmed with the playbook. It was hard to, to not only play but get the plays down. Um, and so in, in that sense, it allows him and his fellow teammates to play faster and as well as uh, Clancy also talked about Talano Hufunga, and not during the mock game week, he said Talano's two eyes. Years ago. Two years ago, yeah, thank you. Uh, his eyes were as wide as, so as yeah, <laughs> as wide as saucers because it was just so much for him to take in. But it seems like, as far as Clancy goes, he's changed that philosophy where he does give his players a better advantage to succeed. I mean, he's just comfortable. I, I like it that Clancy's comfortable with where they are. You know, he was. Uh, I mean, that's what we didn't understand. Going into September last year, uh, Talanoa was like third team. Yeah. And you're like, wait a minute, he's like your best player in the secondary. Well, uh, Clancy was a little hesitant because he said it, we were going into that junior college stadium, and he's all, you know, wide-eyed, and it was like, I don't know. Then, for USC, luckily, there were enough departures and injuries and what have you that he ended up on the field right away, uh, and showed. You know, that that wasn't going to be a problem with Talanoa. And I, I do think when you know, Clancy's talking about guys like Greg Johnson moving, moving to the nickel and just one after another, feeling more confident about guys, uh, you know, the, the inside linebackers and, and how the three of them uh, can play together. And he just feels really co confident and comfortable that they're going to be able to do exactly what they want them to do. And talked about... Uh, he thinks, in terms of competition, with the, with the depth chart not being released till Friday, are there positions still up for grabs? He said, well, yes, but then he qualified it and said, because of our different packages, mm -hmm. I don't know if in the base defense, and we tried to get him to say, hey, the base defense looks like it may well be that four, four down linemen with the two, with Christian Rector and Drake Jackson, and then two of the three, uh, uh, Marlon Tui um uh, Jay Tufelli, and Brandon Peely. Yeah. Two of those three. And that that will be your, your base, uh, base group. And then uh, your two inside linebackers. And then five, uh, five, guy, five secondary people with the, with the nickel. And uh, one would think that would be the defense uh, that you might see more than any other. But uh, Clancy wasn't about to say, yeah, that, that's what you're going to see. But just to get... You don't want to get the best 11 guys on the field. You would think that's the way to go. Yeah, but Clancy's one, not one to share inside details like that. Uh, but you mentioned the depth chart. This is the, going to be the first public depth chart besides just the quarterbacks that we've seen uh, made public uh, all fall camp. So we'll get a sense of that on Friday. But, Dan, what are you expecting as far as that goes? Are there any question marks in your mind as far as the depth chart? No, and I don't know. Are we going to see ors, for example, yeah. at corner? Are we going to see Elijah Griffin or Isaac Taylor Stewart? I, I don't know, uh, at uh, uh, Nickel, are we going to see uh, Greg Johnson or uh, Chase Williams? I, I, I don't know how, yeah. how that's going to go. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I just don't think there are that many up for grabs. But I think there are, uh, you know, a couple that you could say they're that close, that, that they're both, both going to be out there. I know Clancy doesn't like the idea of doing a lot of substituting in the back seven. He just yeah. uh, said, man... You, you just don't want to put a, a like a fresh guy in there who really isn't into the game. He's not lathered up yet, and he's got to end up covering the best best playmaker on the other team. He said, so 
he said, you can definitely see up front where you'd be uh, rotating them in and out. But yeah. he said, it's not a guarantee uh, that you, you're going to be doing that as much uh, in the back seven. Yeah, and speaking of the back seven, I was going to ask you, uh, someone made the point to Clancy today that uh, both Talano and Hunafunga and Isaiah Pulamau have not actually played together yet just because of their injuries were timed differently. Um, and as well as ITS, OG, and, and Chris Steele, those are guys who are still green. Chris Steele hasn't even played it down yet as far as college football goes. How do you expect this the secondary to look when these are still guys that have not a lot of experience compared to other teams maybe in the Pac-12? I think what they're going to try to do is make you uh, one-dimensional. I think they're going to try to take the run away and stop you and force you uh, to depend on the pass with maybe a quarterback who hasn't uh, and had a chance. What did he complete? Eight passes last year, I think. Yeah. Uh, and make him throw in maybe more obvious passing uh, situations where it's third and relatively long. Yeah. And I think that's the best way to really help a young secondary is to put them in situations where uh, they know it's coming. you got to throw it. You're taking a big chance if you're going to run the ball in third and long. Uh, so I think they're going to really depend on uh, the guys up front to not let uh, them get their running game going and then force them to uh, – to be throwing when you know they're throwing. And yeah. if that, help, that that should really help a young secondary. Mm -hmm. As far as injury updates go, I don't want to classify Andrew Voorhees as an injury since we don't know yet, but that's something just to watch out for. Uh, Max Williams has not practiced yet. He's still out of pads. We did see Ethan Ray and uh, Kyle Ford go in full pads on Tuesday, do some rehab work, but then uh, today they were not dressed out, so not sure if there was a, a devel development there. And then uh, Abdul Malik McLean uh, has been doing some warm-ups with the team, but is not dressed out. So it seems like he's making some sort of progress, but not enough to actually rejoin the team. But as far as that goes, uh, no more injury updates as from what we've seen in Wednesdays we can't talk to Clay Hilton. I mean yeah they're in really relatively very good shape yeah. I mean really really good shape so uh, and they've, they've been more physical and they're in uh, they've, they've suffered a fewer injuries so mm -hmm. you put that together and see where that takes you. Mm -hmm. Alrighty, Dan, it's the time that you hate. It's time for predictions Saturday the season opener against Fresno State. What are you expecting for the Trojans? You know I think I, I just don't see uh, Fresno having the kind of team they had last year. If they, they were bringing last year's team here, man, it would be hard to pick USC. Uh, you, you know, this is a better USC team. I probably still would pick them. Uh, I wouldn't have picked them last year against Fresno uh, for sure. But uh, uh, I think I just don't think Fresno has got enough players who've, uh, who have played the game enough and are going to be ready enough. And I get the sense that they might know that if if USC is USC. If, yeah. I know uh, Tedford is probably thinking, if that's a typical USC, the time, kind of team that I've never been able to beat in the Coliseum, we're probably in trouble. If USC's like it was, you know, last year, hey, everybody's got a shot. Cal had a shot, Arizona State had a shot. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen. I think they're going to start fast. I think they know with this uh, front-loaded schedule, they have to be ready to go on offense. It's yeah. not, I know a lot of people say, oh, new system, uh, it's going to take them a while. They're going to, I don't think so. I think they've got to come out of the gate really ready to go. And uh, so it wouldn't surprise me if it was a, a fairly um, substantial USC in a victory. If he said, is it even remotely possible you have a 45 to 14 game or something like that? said, yeah, I think that might be possible. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying it is. Don't go to <laughs> Vegas and, uh, and blame me because uh, I really don't, I don't do that. I, but I can create that scenario. I know this. In the Vegas odds, uh, USC, uh, the USC uh, Fresno State game had the third biggest move of the week. It, uh, it went from a 10-point favorite USC to a 13-and-a-half-point USC favorite. So somebody's telling you something I don't do they know anything I don't know but that's the direction this game is moving and some of that is maybe a reaction to the uh, Fresno's injuries you know running yeah, backs yeah. and people like that that aren't going to be able to play and uh, the fact that USC uh, went with JT Daniels and and hasn't really suffered any of those kind of injuries that, that look like they're going to really really hurt them 
But uh, that's kind of where I am. I think USC, I think USC almost has to uh, come out and play like that. They cannot play like they did against UNLV and West, Western Michigan. Yeah. They've got to come out and really establish who they are because they got to be, uh, you know, able to go to um, go to the, uh, the Stanford game next week and then go to BYU, a couple of really physical teams. And USC's got to be able to, you know, get out in front and, uh, and run that offense really well. So I think that they do that. Then you put a team, we saw this a lot with Pete, Pete Carroll's teams, is teams would get behind and then they've got to throw the ball. And then they got to, they got to throw it in places they don't want to throw it. Yeah. And then, you, you know, you end up taking it away and you've got short fields and things like that. I think there's a potential for that. But, again, that's kind of a leap of faith because all, I, all you say is five and seven. Mm -hmm. and, but uh, I don't think this is that team anymore. But uh, uh, so that would be, be my take. Well, in terms of who this team is, for, for people who haven't been – they haven't seen the fall showcase. They don't know what to expect on Saturday. What would you tell the fans what they should look for on Saturday? I think they'll run to the football on defense. I think you'll see, uh, I know the fans have not been happy with how they've tackled. Uh, I think they're going to tackle, uh, they're not going to look the same the way they've had to just get themselves ready playing against this offense. Uh, they've got a lot of guys that are pretty athletic and looks like they want to run to the ball. And so I think you're going to see that and you'll go, oh, I haven't seen that in a while. That's pretty good. And I do think the offense is going to have a chance to execute really well with eight or nine or ten guys catching the ball. And I think because of the way they run to the football for every play, where the linemen, that's, they're really coached to do that. As soon as that play's over, they run up there and they're at the ball and they're ready to go. Uh, and they've got short play calls and so they can go quickly. And I think uh, you'll see kind of a tempo that we haven't, they haven't been willing to use in the past a lot. And uh, I think this offense, you probably, I know some of the fans were not happy that they get a lead and then they kind of play it safe or hold up. I don't think there's any possibility that they can do that with this offense. Yeah. I mean, you're just going to keep going and going and going. Uh, so what happens, say, end of the third quarter, start of the fourth, if USC has the kind of ability to maintain that tempo and keep pushing, 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 uh, defenses can get heavy-legged. They can get kind of like, boy, this is a lot of running. Yeah. Uh, I know that's the theory for USC. So if that happens, uh, it'd be kind of interesting to see something you haven't seen before. So I think on offense and defense, you've got a chance to see something uh, you won't have seen before and then come out early and watch uh, Ben Griffiths punt the ball. Yeah. <laughs> and see, I'm not sure if I'm going to predict how many times you can punt it in the game, but uh, come out early and watch him, watch him punt it then. Yep. Alrighty, that's going to wrap it up. That's also going to wrap up soon the longest offseason it felt like for yeah, USC. Yeah. <laughs> a real game will be played on Saturday, so make sure you watch out for instant analysis after the game. We'll have that as well as all the content on uscfootball.com. But for Dan Weber, I'm Keely Orr. For more, check out uscfootball.com.